So today's seminar speaker is uh, Professor Bob Marshall from the University of Colorado, uh, and he did his PhD in electrical engineering at uh, Stanford University and graduated in 2009. Following that, he was an NSF CDAR GEM postdoc for two years at Boston University and then returned to Stanford uh, from 2011 to 2015, uh, where he was, he was a research associate. And then just last year, he joined the faculty in the CU Department of Aerospace Engineering as an assistant professor, uh, where he is still now. And his interests are in the study of the atmosphere, ionosphere, and magnetosphere using uh, simulation and observation. And today he will talk about the atmospheric signatures of energetic particle precipitation in the upper atmosphere. Basically, right. right. Thanks, Nick. Um, so yeah, th thanks for the introduction. Um, as Nick mentioned, my mentioned my um, my sort of range of research interests for this community sounds probably extremely broad. Everybody is doing something in that <laughs> list of topics, and that's actually partly because I have a wide variety of things that I'm working on. Um, studying my, my background was primarily studying lightning and the effects of lightning in the upper atmosphere, and ionosphere and magnetosphere. And then recently, in the last few years I, that I was at Stanford, I got uh, started working on meteor observations and modeling of meteor plasma. Um, and then this is a topic that has kind of carried over from a bunch of small pieces that I've looked at over the years. Um, and so I'll talk about a little bit about what I've been doing in the last year or so. Um, and at the very end, if I have time, I'll talk about how I actually got started in this area. It's kind of out of order, but it's, there's a logical reason for doing that, and you'll see. Um, so the topic is atmospheric signatures of energetic particle precipitation in the upper atmosphere. And so the basic overview picture is something like this. We have particles impinging on the upper atmosphere uh, from space. These can be radiation belt particles, radiation belt precipitation, uh, or solar energetic protons, or other types of particle sources they reach the atmosphere. And when they do that, the, the, the real particle physics is, what's, is what starts in the upper atmosphere. And what you end up getting with particle precipitation is you get, um, I want to say, optical emissions, which are obviously shown here. So aurora is one example of that, but I'm looking more at the higher energy particle precipitation. Uh, you get ionization signatures that can be seen by ground-based radars or other instruments. Um, you get these X-ray emissions, which is a, a, one of the major focuses that I'm looking at recently. And so to measure those X-ray emissions, you, you can't do that from the ground, so you might need a balloon instrument or a CubeSat. And I'll talk about some of those concepts coming up. Um, the other things that I'm not going to talk about too much today are a few other of these diagnostics. Uh, backscatter of electrons, I'll mention a little bit about that. Um, and then the chemistry, which obviously uh, Dr. Marsh is very interested in. I'll, I'll touch briefly on in the introduction here. So this is kind of giving a list of the various diagnostics that we could use to actually measure this precipitation. And um, I didn't mention the actual in situ measurement of those electrons. And that's actually a fairly difficult measurement to make. It's you know isolated in space with an orbiting spacecraft. Um, so it, that is one of the diagnostics, but it's not one of the things I'm looking at in this work. Okay. So there's two kind of primary motivations. Whether you're a radiation belt person or an atmosphere person, you think of this in, in a different way. So if you're a radiation belt person, you're interested in precipitation because it's a loss mechanism. It's one of the primary mechanisms by which radiation belt electrons are lost. Um, so on the left here is an example from uh, Dan Baker's recent Nature paper. So this is Van Allen Probe's data um, at, as a function of L shell and time over almost two years. What you're looking at are major precipitation, or sorry, major enhancements of radiation belt electrons. So the red are these massive enhancements due to um, substorms or other types of events. And then those, those enhancements decay over some time. And that decay is caused by a number of loss mechanisms, but the precipitation in the atmosphere is one of the major loss mechanisms. So the question you know, that we want to be able to answer is to what extent does the atmosphere control these radiation belt losses? And those losses then lead to uh, understanding the lifetimes of these radiation belt particles. And currently, measurements of the lifetimes don't agree particularly well. Your, your microphone is cutting in and out. Yeah, I know. Well, I, can you just turn it off? And I, well, I they want to record, so. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'll go over to Brian. For some reason, when you step back, I don't think they're going to keep, keep going. It might be. This, it's not that one picking 
I'm gonna. I'm just gonna. I, is it? It's kind of irritating. <laughs> <laughs> we can. People can see. Yeah. What do you? Is it? Presumably, there's thousands of people watching online. So oh, okay. we have to be. We have to be cognizant of the. The but they're not going to. They're going to be able to hear half of what you're saying. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, right, yeah, we'll get it. They're going to deal with it. Hopefully. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the, I was just mentioning that the, the lifetimes are are um, between measurements and modeling currently don't agree particularly well. Um, okay. So that's motivation number one. Now, if you're an atmosphere person, you're looking at the radiation belt precipitation or high energy particle precipitation of different sources as a source for atmospheric chemistry. So this is my one slide on atmospheric chemistry because I don't know very much about it at all, except to say that precipitation from the radiation belts or from space uh, causes uh, deposits energy in the upper atmosphere, and through chemistry that can lead to the formation of NOx and HOx, um, odd nitrogen and odd hydrogen. And that odd nitrogen, shown here uh, on an example um, measurement, uh, in the polar winter, descends down to lower altitudes, all the way down into the stratosphere, where it can react with ozone. Um, so ultimately, the point here is that this particle precipitation has an impact on the entire global climate system, including these important chemicals such as NOx, HOx, and ozone. And uh, furthermore, so this is these are two examples that I um, were given to me by Cora Randall. Um, and so this is a, a measurement here, altitude versus time, NOx um, uh, concentration. And then this is the Wacom model attempt to reproduce that event. And similarly, here's another event that was measured by MEPAS, and then there's the, the reconstruction. And what you notice is that the, they don't match up very well. It's not, it's not capturing this descent particularly well in either event. And according to Cora, and I'm repeating what she's told me, is that this is due to either the transport uh, of this NOx to lower altitudes, or the actual specification of the energetic particle, particle precipitation as the input to the model. Um, it could be both as well. So the goal, the short-term goal, is to get a better understanding of what that energetic precipitation flux is. And if the models still don't match up, then you can look at the transport question. So that's a brief introduction on the sort of atmospheric effects of this stuff. But so I'm mainly focused right now on the actual diagnostics and predicting what those diagnostics would look like, which could then, once you make a measurement, you can then infer the actual precipitating flux and spectra. Um, and so today I'll talk about um, the various, these various mechanisms, or sorry, um, diagnostics that I talked about, the energy deposition and disturbance of the electron density profiles. Um, and for each of these, there's, there's measurements associated with them. So after that, I'll talk a little bit about optical emissions and how we might see these. Um, X-ray production and measurements of those X-rays due to precipitation. And then uh, this is the, if I have time, I want to talk, I'll, I'll introduce you guys to lightning-induced electron precipitation if you haven't heard of that before, uh, which kind of encompasses all of these aspects as well. Okay, so the way I look at this uh, is currently is through a modeling paradigm that's based around a Monte Carlo model. And this mon this is a, the Monte Carlo model is kind of the center here. It's this green block. And there, then there are a lot of other pieces which calculate all these diagnostics that I'm interested in. So all these red blocks are actually the outputs of different calculations to get to those diagnostics. Um, and the way this whole system works is we start with some distribution of particles. And I can use a real distribution from an actual measurement. Uh, the nice thing about Monte Carlo is you can specify it to as much detail as you want, as long as you have enough particles. We run that through the Monte Carlo model in the electron side, and we get out deposition profiles, um, the number of particles that are backscattered back into space. And then from that energy deposition, we get ionization. Um, the ionization now, this is essentially the production of new ionization in the atmosphere. And that actually has to go now through a chemistry model to give me an electron density profile. I'll talk about that. Uh, coming up. Um, the model is nice in that it includes the, the nice feature about this particular Monte Carlo model. This was, this was written and built by um, a former Stanford po student and then postdoc um, back in but the late 90s. So this is, model has been around for a while. But we've made some updates to it. Um, it can include all of the electric, uh, you can include electric fields. It was actually designed to look at the acceleration of electrons in high electric fields. You can include the Earth's magnetic field, and you can include a, a, a grad B force, which causes the mirroring effect. 
So those are obviously very important effects for this application. Um, and that's enough I'll say about the model, unless anybody has questions on it. Um, ultimately, it's, a, you know, it's, it's modeling sort of through random processes, the collisions of particles with the atmosphere, and calculating how much energy is lost, what are the energies of the new particles that are created, what are the energies and directions of photons that are created, such as x-rays. And so there's, there's random collisions, and there's propagation of all these particles in the Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo model. Bob, what's the energy domain for that model? Oh, it, um, it goes down as low as, currently as, as low as 2 keV, and as high as whatever the high you want to go. The problem with higher energies is because they cascade and create a lot of lower energy particles. If you started with one, like, TeV particle, which you could do, you would end up with millions and millions of secondaries, and the model would take forever to run. Um, at the low energies, the model, so the, the red line here is my cross-section, the model does not currently capture the detail below 2 keV, and that is actually something I have a postdoc working on right now. So within the next six months, I think, we're, this will work down to sub-EV. Uh, and there's a few reasons that we want to do that, like we'll talk about later. Um, OK, so the energy deposition looks something like this. And this is not particularly new. Uh, I, for one, think it's kind of cool that I can reproduce these figures in this model quite easily. Uh, so figures like this have been published in a number of papers. This goes back to a rural uh, theory where you put in some distribution of precipitating auroral electrons, and you want to figure out where that energy gets deposited. And so what we've done here is I've put in a Maxwellian distribution with some characteristic energy uh, shown here. And I've also done the monoenergetic input distributions, which is basically a beam of electrons. And you get out these nice deposition profiles that show you for a distribution of electrons at 10, 10 keV characteristic energy, this is where the energy goes. And you can calculate what the peak altitude of energy deposition is. And we've done that to then create these profiles, which um, this was actually done for a proposal just last week, where we took we kind of did the inverse picture. Rather than figuring out what altitude certain energies go to, we wanted to figure out what energies go to certain altitudes. Um, so this is actually showing the energy uh, of the distribution that, that peaks at these altitudes. It's kind of a backwards way of looking at it. Um, but you can look, the, the profile is the same either way. Um, so the, the obvious things that stand out here, higher, energies, higher energy particles deposit at lower altitudes. Um, but because the atmosphere is exponential in density, um, this is not linear in energy, right? As we're going down linearly in altitude, the energy is almost doubling every five kilometers. So it gets harder and harder to get to lower altitudes. Um, and then secondly, of course, the profile, the, the, the energy deposition profile you get really depends on that input energy distribution. So that kind of accentuates the fact that we need to know this. So did you say these are assumed isotropic and pitch angle, or? These are isotropic and pitch angle. Okay. They, that happens to be the way I ran this case, yeah. but it doesn't have to be. I can actually do any pitch angle distribution that is of interest to you. Um, so I've done beamed pitch angles, I've done isotropic, I've done lost cone style sine distributions, various things. Um, the biggest problem, of course, is the lack of good measurements of pitch angle distributions to know what to put into the model. Um, and I'll, actually, I'll come back to that in a few slides. Maybe now. Um, so th this is actually one of my motivations for getting into this, was uh, noticing in all the measurements the lack of pitch angle, distribution, pitch angle resolution in both um, equatorial missions as well as low Earth orbit missions. And um, so all of these plots are showing some important parameter that I'll talk about as a function of pitch angle. The loss cone, the, the nominal loss cone angle for this simulation was 73 degrees. That means I started these electrons from 300 kilometers. A, an electron at a 73 degree pitch angle at 300 kilometers would be 90 degrees at 100 kilometers. Um, that's what I mean by the loss cone there. And so this is showing, for example, how many of these electrons actually get deposited um, as a function of energy, as a function of pitch angle. And for higher energies, more gets deposited until you start to get close to this loss cone angle. And, and for lower energies, you know, here we're actually we're deep inside the loss cone, but still only 90% is getting deposited. I'll come back to the importance of that in a little bit. 
Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting here was this is showing that same peak of the altitude of peak energy deposition for different energies. And you notice that they're not flat as a function of pitch angle. So the, again, the, the, the importance here is that the pitch angle distribution actually matters as far as where this energy goes. It is, we've looked at this a little bit more closely, and you start to realize that for the typical energy ranges, kind of below a couple of, EV, a couple of MeV, the altitude variation is really only a couple kilometers, so this might not be a huge effect. Um, and then the other thing I guess I'll just emphasize with these slides is you're looking at you know, the energy deposited, kind of trying to calculate the mean, the average energy that, energy that gets backscattered. So these are actually the incident particles coming in, they scatter around, and then they come back. And they lose a good fraction of their energy. Um, but the important thing in, in a bunch of these plots is just that a significant fraction of particles actually, that are in the loss cone actually get backscattered. A significant fraction of the energy that you would normally consider to be in the loss cone gets backscattered back into space. Now it will backscatter in the loss cone, so it will wrap around and reach the conjugate atmosphere. But you know things can happen on that trajectory uh, with wave particle interactions that we don't really know at this point. Um, so um, just for anybody that's not totally familiar, I wanted to come back. I can probably skip this. What do you guys think? No, I won't skip this. This is the just the idea of the loss cone. If you have a particle bouncing around in the magnetosphere here, trapped on a magnetic field line, at the equator there is some angle that its trajectory makes to the magnetic field. It's making a helix, but that helix has some angle, uh, which is typically called alpha. Um, but you can kind of see here as the angle between this VP and this V. Now, if a particle is, if its, if its pitch angle is greater than the loss cone angle, then it'll mirror, it'll turn around far before it reaches the atmosphere. If it's well inside the loss cone, then it's going to reach deep into the atmosphere and be lost due to these collisional processes. But if it's right at the edge, you know, it's going to end up grazing. So this is a loss cone uh, grazing incidence particle that's going to reach just down to about 100 kilometer altitude. And this, the, the, actually the reason I brought this up and put this in here is um, this alpha loss cone is defined rather arbitrarily. Um, it's actually defined very specifically as the angle where a particle will, will reach 100 kilometer altitude. And I don't remember why, but for some reason I was reading some paper on this and it just occurred to me, like, why do they pick 100 kilometers? And then I dug down and tried to find the papers that were cited and figure out where this 100 kilometers came from. And there's no, like, initial calculation that said there's a, there's a very good reason why it's 100 kilometers. So I thought it would be fun to try to test it and figure out if 100 kilometers actually makes sense. And we can do that. So as I mentioned, the bounce loss cone is defined by this 100 kilometer mirror altitude. Uh, does that hold up to scrutiny? It turns out it kind of does, but it actually depends on energy. So it's an, there's actually an energy dependent loss cone angle. Um, so what these plots are showing are, what I've done is essentially done a Monte Carlo simulation with each into discrete pitch angles at less than, better than one degree resolution, and figured out how much of the total energy that's input or the total particles that are input get backscattered or mirrored. And so what this is showing here is the, um, the fraction that gets backscattered. So at one here, everything is backscattered slash mirrored. And um, I've then translated that fraction into a mirror al an effective mirror altitude an effective equatorial loss cone angle. So that would be the loss cone angle way out at the equator, and I think this is an L of L equals five or something. Um, and then the loss cone angle at 500 kilometers altitude where you might have a spacecraft measuring these particles. And so you can see that 100 kilometers, it's kind of in that range, uh, but it depends on the energy, and then it depends on sort of how you define the loss cone. Do you define the loss cone as where 50% of particles are backscattered and 50% are deposited? Or do you find it where 90% are backscattered? So it, it depends, right? If at 90% backscattered, then multiple bounces need to occur before you get most of them deposited. It'll be 90, and then it'll be 81, and then it'll be uh, whatever 9 cubed is. 
and so forth. Um, but so ultimately, you, get, you, you do get this energy effect. And it's kind of fascinating, too, that some of these low energy particles, they, they look like they're actually going to hit the Earth. But they do get backscattered before that happens. Um, and then, you know, for a low altitude mission, and I, I do this because I'm personally interested in having a low altitude mission that can measure one degree pitch angle resolution. No such thing has been created, but fingers crossed, sometime in the future. Um, you know, here's a three or four degree difference in what constitutes the loss cone. Um, so to me, this is important potentially for future missions. Okay, so that's kind of a, an aside um, of some of the work that I've been doing. Um, but so moving forward, sort of going back to these, these um, diagnostics in the atmosphere. So now what we've done is we've kind of looked at more specific actual precipitation cases. Rather than looking at discrete energies and pitch angles, use a real distribution. And um, I like this paper, um, Whitaker et al. from 2013, that looked at Demeter data over the course of 10 years and found kind of the average, the mean fluxes, um, and also the energy distributions from Demeter. Because Demeter actually is one of, the, one of the best spacecraft. It was orbiting low Earth orbit at 660 kilometer altitude and had one of the best pitch angle, sorry, excuse me, energy resolutions uh, of any spacecraft measuring energetic particles because it had, a, I think, 128 energy channels. Um, so what they were able to do is actually fit um, uh, exponential profiles and power law profiles to the measured distrib energy electron distributions and see how those um, E-folding parameters and power gradients vary with uh, L-shell and also with KP index. Um, and it's, it's, it's a particularly robust analysis. It turns out these hold very well from, from day to day. Um, so you get these, these, so now we have a, um, a precipitating distribution that we can rely on. We can use different E-folding values or different power law uh, constants uh, to create distributions, simulate them entering the atmosphere, and look at those effects. Um, they also give us a nice mean flux value. So here in the outer radiation belt, you know, you're looking at about 10 to the 5. This is electrons per centimeter squared per second. Um, uh, that's kind of an average precipitating uh, flux. So I use that flux. I use the energy range from Demeter, uh, create profiles, and start simulating these things entering the atmosphere. And so here's a, just a couple of quick cases. Um, we've now gone from the energy deposition profiles and converted those into ionization profiles just using the there's a standard assumption that for every 35 EV that's deposited, it creates one electron ion pair. And that's a, a rule that's been around since the 60s, I think, uh, and is still used regularly. So here is two example um, ionization profiles for a different exponential distribution and a different power law distribution. Same total flux. And then this ionization has to go into a model. And so I'm using um, a five species chemistry model to determine the actual electron density as a function of time. And so the ionization becomes the source term here, Q. So we're creating electrons and we're creating ions. And then the other species are, are sort of uh, lumped together as light negative ions, light positive ions, heavy negative ions, and heavy positive ions. Yeah. Does this include the multiple bounces? Or just no, a single no. First? This is just a single first bounce. I've been, I've been meaning to do that, but I haven't got around to doing that yet. Um, so this ionization profile now becomes this electron density profile. And you can see most of this ionization is below 100 kilometers. So we're getting a big enhancement in the electron density at the low altitudes, really not much change at the, the, those higher altitudes. And this is because the, um, on the previous slide here, sorry, the, you know, the energy range from Demeter, it's, it's lowest, the lowest energy bin we're looking at is 90 keV. 90 keV has a dep deposition altitude of roughly below 90 kilometer altitude. So you're, we're seeing all of that, oh jeez, apologize. We're seeing all of the, that deposition at these lower altitudes because we're not including the low energy particles in the simulation. Um, so that's an example. Um, most recently, we've started looking at actually particular precipitation events. And this is starting to get a lot more interesting, I think. 
so this is a case um, from 2015, and we have a couple cases from just this past January that we're looking at in great detail, of precipitation that's measured by the poker flat incoherent scatter radar. Pfizer. Um, for those who are not familiar, um, the, this is a radar that's located up in the middle of Alaska that measures, among other things, actually measures the electron density profile here. So we're looking at electron density as a function of altitude. And it can do it in pretty, pretty high time resolution. And uh, recently, because of some nice processing tricks that the guys at SRI have figured out, they can see electron density down to almost 60 kilometer altitude, um, which is, which is it's quite impressive. They haven't been able to do that until just the past year or two. So here's a case we're looking at this yellow stuff where there's clearly precipitation down to 80 kilometers and a little bit below. So we're looking at probably tens to maybe 100 keV electrons. Um, you'll notice that beam one and beam two, these are just two, the radar can steer and point different beams at different spots in the sky. So beam one and beam two are looking at two different spots in the sky, but only separated by a few tens of kilometers, and they're seeing very different signatures. Uh, so there's clearly huge spatial effects going on here that we are not yet able to uh, understand. And then at the same time, uh, here are those radar beams on the sky. And here are the footprints of the Van Allen probe spacecraft at the same time. They don't quite ever get quite up to the latitude of Poker Flat, which is quite irritating. <laughs> um, but they get pretty close. So we're thinking, you know, we're looking at this wave activity measured on Van Allen probes, uh, magnetic field and electric field wave activity, and trying to correlate that with this, uh, precipitation, these precipitation signatures. Um, so anyway, now I can take this precipitation signature and put it in the model, and that's what we've done here. Um, this is actually from the, this is a little bit confusing, and I don't want to be deceptive, but this is 13th of January 2015. This is actually 13th of January 2016 event. It happened to occur on the same day of the year, but it's this year's data. And so here's the, um, the poker flat electron density as a function of altitude and time. And then the guys at SRI have now used the, the GLOW model to do essentially the same modeling uh, to look to see how can we reproduce this, um, this electron density signature. And the way this is done, actually, I, I forgot to include UCLA in here because colleagues at UCLA have taken the Van Allen probes data, which is measured way out at, at the equatorial region at high altitude, and using diffusion coefficient, modeling diffusion coefficients, they've mapped down what they think is going to precipitate in the atmosphere. So there's an extra modeling step that is not particularly robust because Van Allen probes has very poor pitch angle resolution um, at the equatorial region. So anyway, there's a, there's a reasonable guess about what's precipitating in the atmosphere. And then both using the GLOW model and using our Monte Carlo model, we put that in and try to and estimate this electron density signature. And so I would probably argue that we're not doing particularly well so far. Um, you're, you'll notice quantitatively on an order of magnitude, it's, it's pretty good. Um, the yellow lines here you'll see are essentially the background atmosphere. There was no data for those stripes. So there is a significant enhancement from the yellow to the red that's due to precipitation. Um, but we're not, this big bright red uh, feature here and here is uh, we think mainly actually auroral precipitation. Um, sorry, that here, but it's actually not produced in the model. Um, we're we're getting some of the features in here, but you know you can kind of stare at it, stare at it and agree with yourself if you want to. Um, but the main thing that we're not getting is really the altitude extent. The data really shows precipitation down to 75 kilometers here, and we are not seeing that. We're seeing a very sharp shelf at about 85 kilometers. Um, and that's because of the processing of this data. Um, the HOPE instrument on Van Allen probes only goes down to about 50 keV. So we're in the process now of trying to include the data from the higher energy instruments on Van Allen probes to get that higher energy precipitation down to, down to lower altitudes. OK. Um, so that's the energy deposition ionization. So as you can see, we can kind of reproduce or model electron density profiles created by precipitation. Um, and the goal 
you know, in the future, it would be to be able to look at these electron density prof electron dense model electron density profiles and infer the precipitating flux and distribution. But it's a really difficult problem. So looking at the other diagnostics here, um, let's talk about optics for a little bit. Um, you all know that when particles hit the atmosphere, they produce photons. That's known as the aurora. Um, but we're looking at, again, the higher energy particles, radiation belt precipitation, which are considerably lower fluxes than auroral precipitation, and obviously higher energies. So here's that same case that I showed before, where we've got our ionization profiles, uh, which are then mapped through the chemistry to our electron density profiles. And then these are put into a, a model of the optical emissions, which is a very standard calculation uh, that uses all of the quenching rates and excitation rates and Einstein coefficients for all different op optical emissions in the upper atmosphere. And ultimately, we get out these emission profiles. So these are photons emitted per cubic meter per second as a function of altitude. And we've got, I'm looking particularly at two emissions here, the N2 first positive emission, which is a, a red uh, emission band um, system, and then the N2 second positive, which is a blue. And I really wish I had colored those differently. <laughs> the, the, this is actually a blue emission, and this is a red emission. So my, my profiles are really, unfortunately, uh, colored. Anyway, we can then take those photon emission profiles and say, say we design some canonical instrument that sits on the ground. So we've got some CCD camera or OSCI camera or photometer, whatever you want to design. You can integrate these profiles to figure out how many photons are going to reach the ground. And I've been doing this for years where I have a model now that includes uh, all the attenuation through the atmosphere using ModTran. Uh, you can put in any optical instrument that you're interested in and figure out essentially what brightness you're going to see on the ground. And so that's what we've done here for the N2 first positive, um, N2 plus first negative, which is um, some blue emissions, uh, which are very nice for detecting on the ground. And then this um, O single dust green line, which is the primary emission line in the aurora. And for reference, we're looking at a couple hundred Rayleigh's and tens of Rayleigh's here. For reference, aurora is not visible until it's about four kilo Rayleigh's. So these are very low brightnesses, but they're not undetectable. We have, uh, um, there have been plenty of experiments that have been done uh, looking at optical emissions from the upper atmosphere where you can measure one and two Rayleigh signatures. It's just a matter of seeing it above the background. Um, so these are definitely measurable numbers, and I'll talk about that uh, shortly. Um, right here. So again, I've done the same thing where I've looked at the different distributions, different uh, power law and exponential precipitating distributions from Demeter, get our ionization profiles, and then get our optical emission profiles. And I have uh, nominally designed or estimated the uh, optical signatures for a nice six inch lens. So this is a big, very large lens. It's f0.5, uh, which is a very high. That very fast F number. I don't know if anybody else has ever bought a six inch F.5 lens. Uh, and so this is a photometer uh, instrument. And then I've also done it for a, a sort of standard low noise CCD camera. And these plots actually show you for those different profiles what kind of signal to noise you would expect from these um, precipitating signatures. Uh, so for both the exponential and the power law, we're looking at signal, signal to noise for the photometer of 20 to 50 and signal to noise in the single digits for the camera. So these are, these are pretty good. These are pretty, pretty positive. Uh, I feel good that we could actually measure some optical emissions. So can you build something like this? Um, the answer is yes. And this is a photometer instrument that I built a couple of years ago. And the way you get 6 inches in f.5 is by using a Fresnel lens. When you have a photometer, you do not care about image quality. And this thing will give you really unbelievably terrible Im image quality. Um, but as long as it gets the photons down into here, that's all we care about. Um, so this instrument has um, a blue filter, which is this BG3 glass filter, to look at nitrogen emissions. And then it has a second channel that has a, a green filter. You can kind of see the window on the front here. Um, and those are some very expensive uh, transmission filters. So we have a green line channel and a what I call a blue line channel, which is looking at the nitrogen emissions. And this is currently set up at Poker Flat 
um, not on the radar, but near in the optical shed near the radar in one of these um, optical domes looking up at the sky. Uh, that was, the instrument was completed in the fall last year, but did not get installed until April. And if you know anything about Alaska, April is a bad time to start trying to do optical experiments because you no longer have any nighttime. So we're waiting for October to come around and start measuring again. Um, and then we'll start to hopefully see some really interesting events. Um, I'll come back to this instrument if I have time uh, when I talk about LEP. So that's, um, that's all I have to say about optics. I really want to get into the x-rays, which is really what's going to take the most time here. Because um, this is, to me, this is really interesting and really exciting. So um, I'll just get right to it. The, the important thing is we have these particles impinging on the upper atmosphere. And just for those that are not familiar, um, when you have high energy particles colliding with matter, you basically have a particle accelerator experiment, uh, minus the accelerator. Um, and what you, you start to get the standard type of things that people see in particle experiments. And one of those is Bremsstrahlung, which is the production of X-ray or high energy photons uh, due to the interaction of high energy particles with matter. And Bremsstrahlung is exactly how X-ray sources work in the dentist's office, for example. So the, this picture is very tiny, unfortunately, but the basic idea is you have an electron coming in. It comes very close to the nucleus of the atom, which is positively charged. And so the positively charged nucleus accelerates the electron, changing its momentum. And in order to conserve momentum, a photon is emitted. Um, so that's Bremsstrahlung. This is the basic, the, the simple form of the Bremsstrahlung cross-section, which is a quadruply differential cross-section. And all that means is that the flux of photons that's produced depends on the, ang the energy of the photon, it depends on the angles between the photon and the uh, um, sorry between the the photon and the electron. Yes, and it also depends on the angle between these planes. So it gets very complicated, but none of that detail really matters uh, a ton as far as um, the actual simulation of this thing. So it depends, as I said, depends on frequency, the initial electron energy. The electron loses some energy, so it depends on the final energy, also the momentum. Also, the Z atomic number, which is important. If you want to create more photons, it's good to use tungsten. Um, and the, you know, the takeaway, what's kind of interesting here, if you actually plot these cross sections, you can see something like this, which is that for higher, th this is in kilovolts and megavolts, but for electrons, that's KeV and MeV. Uh, for, this is your target, and your electrons are coming this way. For higher energies, the photons tend to be beamed forward. And for lower energies, they tend to be more isotropic. And that's a, an interesting effect that you can very much see in the, in the Monte Carlo modeling of these processes. Um, so that's the, the basic physics. You want to put this in a model. You have to simplify it. I'm going to skip this stuff. Um, and this is how it's actually put in the model. This is a nice plot from um, a paper a couple years ago that tried to take this quadruply differential cross-section and simplify it to a triply differential cross-section. And the, this, it has equations that are literally five pages long, um, probably spat out of Mathematica. But uh, there's a lot of beautiful information here. What they've done is they've taken, looked at different input energies, so 150 keV electron energy versus a 1 MeV. And then this is the ratio of the photon energy to that electron energy. So it's either a low energy photon being produced or a high energy photon being produced. And you can see, for example, that the cross section, 10 to the minus 43, is much higher for low energy photons than it is for high energy photons. So without getting into everything, I just point out that there's, there's all these very interesting relationships that come out of the, um, the basic physics of this process. Um, so now we've, in the Monte Carlo model, we create photons due to these electrons interacting with the atmosphere. Um, the next thing is you have to propagate them. They're created in the atmosphere. Do they reach the ground? Do they reach a CubeSat or a balloon? Um, and then propagating photons uh, involves these three physical effects. Photoelectric effect, where you create uh, new electrons because the photon is absorbed. Um, Compton scattering, where you actually, the photon's not destroyed, but it changes its momentum and electrons are created. Um, and then pair production. In pair production, it's fairly minimal at the very high, at the 
mostly we're down in this energy range. Pair production doesn't become important until above a few MeV. So all of these physical processes are taken into account in the modeling. Um, so here's some, some actual modeling simulation results. Um, what, again, what I've done here is looked at sort of um, discrete simulations at single energies to try to tease out the relationships between those energies and the resulting effects. Um, and what I've done too is I've now set two kind of collecting regions to see what, what gets down and what gets up. So I collect all the photons that reach down to 35 kilometer altitude, which is the nominal altitude for a high altitude balloon experiment. And then I collect all the photons that get back up to 300 kilometers. So that'll tell you what's going to reach, for example, a, a low Earth orbit satellite. Um, so these are the energy distributions of photons that are created for a monoenergetic beam of electrons with these colored energies. So this is a 50 keV uh, electron beam, produces x-rays in this energy range, and then obviously nothing above 50 keV, and a very, very high flux of low energy photons. And then as you get to the higher energy electron beams, you get um, considerably lower fluxes back to 300 kilometers, but a lot more high energy photons, of course. And then in the balloon case, the converse is true, where the lowest energies, almost nothing reaches the balloon because all those photons get absorbed before they get down to 35 kilometers, whereas the high energy photons do make it all the way down and can be measured by the balloon. Uh, now, the other thing important to point out is for this case, the electrons are actually field aligned. So they're already starting very much projected downwards along the magnetic field line. And I just told you on the last plot, or a couple plots ago, that for high energies, electron going this way creates a photon going this way. So it makes sense that these high energy photons are going to go down, but they're not really going to go up. It would take a lot of scattering events to turn them around and make them go back up to Leo. Um, we also look at the angle spectra, sort of what angles do you expect to see. It turns out the uh, back at LEO, the photons are pretty much isotropic. It looks like they're coming from everywhere. Uh, and at low altitudes, they're fairly beamed, kind of a, a fairly narrow cone. Um, and then the, what I also think is kind of interesting is the total number of photons reaching detectors. I'll just point out that in both these cases, this is total photons, this is total photon energy. There's a factor of two orders of magnitude higher that reaches LEO compared to the balloon altitude. So if you want to set up an experiment with an equivalent instrument, it's better to be in LEO than it is to be on a balloon, um, which will lead into some experiment considerations in a couple slides. So looking at real distributions, again, I've used the same Demeter distribution that I've talked about a couple times already. Um, the distributions, those electron distributions are shown here. This is the distribution of photons that are created. So the colors are different, um, uh, different profiles of that Demeter distribution. Photons created, photons that make it back to LEO, and then photons that make it to the balloon. And you see that at the balloon, most of those low energy photons are, are absorbed. They don't make it to the balloon. But the higher energies, it's almost the same for the two scenarios. Um, and oh, I didn't have. I, I, unfortunately, I didn't get to put on here. I actually have an actual measured spectrum from barrel, sort of an average measured spectrum from a balloon that looks very, very much like this. It matches really nicely, um, which means I pick the altitude well. And the other two plots are showing, again, the angular distribution, but I'll skip that for now. So one of the nice things I can do here is I can say, OK, for this distribution um, of photons, uh, I can compare this to a measurement, for example, from from the balloon data and rescale the output and now figure out what's the actual precipitating flux for that case. And so I've done that for a couple of cases. And so this, this was scaled to a particular event at barrel. And ultimately, we can determine that precipitating flux, which is really one of the key measurements that we're trying to get out of this work. Um, so let's talk about how we would actually measure these. Remember this plot before where I highlighted these x-rated balloon detectors. Uh, so if you haven't heard of Barrel, this is a mission that's been going on for a couple of years. And what they do is they launch balloons from very, very high latitude, and they launch a series of balloons which then drift around, um, around the Earth, uh, high latitude. 
And they're at about? The altitude varies, but 22 to 40 kilometers. And so they're measuring these x-rays that are produced by the precipitating electrons. Um, the electrons never make it down to this altitude, as I showed you at the very beginning. So the x-rays pr produce, or sorry, um, the x-rays form a really nice diagnostic of that. Um, so that's a mission that's been going on. There's some nice data from it already. I'll show you just a couple cases. Um, here is um, x-ray fluxes as a function of energy. So here's 100 keV. Um, so yes, 100 keV, yes. Uh, 1 MeV and a little bit higher. And so the data shows this really nice drop off uh, below about 50 keV, as I showed on the profiles. Um, and these, these kind of red spikes here, most of this is kind of the background, and then these red spikes here are, are discrete precipitation events that they've detected. Um, and there's a case that was published just last year that shows a really nice correlation between those, those x-rays measured on barrel and electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves, um, and looking at sort of the correlation between those two things. So emic waves producing the precipitation, which then results in these x-ray emissions. So I'm not currently involved in the analysis of that data, um, but it, there's a really nice, there's, a, there's a, quite a few papers that have come out just in the last couple of years um, on this stuff. Um, so I'll just briefly pitch something that I, I'm pretty excited about. I just submitted a proposal actually, so this is not something that's funded, but fingers crossed, um, that would actually do the CubeSat measurement. I mentioned that we would have potentially better fluxes to measure from LEO. Uh, than we would from a balloon. So we've put together um, an instrument design and a CubeSat design that would fly around in LEO, staring down at the upper atmosphere and measuring those like x-rays coming back. And uh, so the instrument is kind of roughly 2U by 2U in, in detector area. Um, and it's an imaging system. So it can actually take an x-ray image of the upper atmosphere with about a thousand kilometer wide swath and see, start to see those spatial, um, the, the spatial effects that were shown up, up with the radar data. Um, so fingers crossed, I think that there's, there's a, um, whether this one goes or not, I think that there's, there's great use for an instrument like this that could measure these x-rays coming back from the atmosphere. Um, OK, so I've probably got about two minutes. So, I will briefly introduce this concept. So and this, is, uh, this is kind of how I got into this type of modeling work in the first place. So I was, a, as, as Nick mentioned, I was a PhD student at Stanford um, with Umran Inan. And this was his research paradigm. And lightning-induced electron precipitation was one of the big physical phenomena that we studied in that group for probably 15 or 20 years. So the basic concept is this. You have a lightning strike and lightning emits electromagnetic radiation. Uh, most of that radiation propagates in the Earth ionosphere waveguide. It bounces between the conducting Earth and the conducting lower ionosphere. But a certain amount of it will leak through the ionosphere and propagate as a Whistler mode wave out into, out into space, um, where it interacts with these high energy particles in the radiation belts. It causes pitch angle scattering to these particles, which then come back down the field lines and potentially hit the atmosphere. So we have this high energy particle precipitation uh, due to lightning on the ground. Um, and that's the basic idea of, of LEP. And it's been measured in a couple of ways. This is actually the paper from the first, the first discovery of this phenomena. Uh, and this is from 1982. There's data from a receiver down here in Antarctica. So it saw these waves propagate all the way around the magnetic field lines and come back to the ground. And they saw these as Whistler mode waves, these sort of hooked events in here. Um, and then the satellite, which I believe was SEEP, uh, yeah, s 811 SEEP instrument, uh, saw these bursts of energetic electrons, which lined up really nicely with those lightning events. Um, so that was the discovery. And now, I mean, th these have been studied for a couple of decades now, and we've seen quite a few different types of events. Um, again, coming back to Demeter, Demeter was a really nice instrument for this because it had the high energy particle detectors, but it also had um, wave detectors. So here's a case or two cases where we saw lightning in the VLF data on the ground, uh, also in the VLF data on the spacecraft, 
which is the wave immediately coming up from the Earth and hitting the satellite, and then a burst of particles a second or so later coming down at the radiation belts. Um, and there's another case of wave activity shown there. Um, so this was actually a more recent uh, sort of method of discovering these things. You can imagine with spacecraft, you can't see them all that often. You have to, again, your satellite has to be in the right place at the right time, it has to fly over a storm. All these things have to work out nicely. Um, so we have had ground-based measurements of these for, for quite a while. And this is a situation where we have VLF receivers, very low frequency receivers in Colorado, and they're measuring transmitters. There's a transmitter in Maine, a transmitter in Seattle, and a couple others. And we measure, we look at the amplitude of these transmitters. And when, when there's a burst of precipitation in the atmosphere, you get these little blips in the amplitude of, or phase of those signals. And you can actually, through modeling again, you can correlate the amplitude of those little dips very quantitatively with the precipitating flux that's reaching the atmosphere. Unfortunately, it's a very 0D measurement of a largely 4D phenomenon. So it's difficult to get a sense of sort of the size of the region and the energies of those precipitating particles. So it's not a perfect measurement, but it does give us some, some really nice data on these things. Um, so in the, a, a few years ago, I then went to the next step and said, well, we know that they're producing ionization. Uh, would lightning-induced electron precipitation produce optical emissions? Um, and so these are some modeling results of that idea. So if we had a lightning strike here at 35 degree latitude, this is the patch of precipitation that it would produce. Um, and so I've nominally said, OK, if I, put a, if I put an optical instrument right there in that tiny little square, and I aim it in that direction, or in some direction in the sky, what would I see? What brightness would I see from this event? And so I did modeling where I look at every possible direction in 4 pi steradians, and that's what this is kind of trying to show. Um, so at a given elevation and azimuth angle, what brightness would I see in Rayleigh's? And so if you looked at that particular direction, you would see one or two Rayleigh's of brightness. <laughs> it's pretty low. It's pretty dim. But uh, that doesn't stop an enthusiastic postdoc uh, from going out and setting, building this instrument, building this, this is the same photometer instrument that's now in Alaska. So it was initially built and plunked down at a forest service tower in South Dakota, in the Black Hills, uh, a hop, skip, and a jump from Mount Rushmore. And there was no, there was power, but there was no internet. So the whole system was set up inside a Pelican case to just run on its own, stare out at the sky. Uh, came back three months later, data was perfect. Um, but really not really any sign of these signatures. So this is an example of the data, the blue and the green channel data, and all the lightning that occurred during that time. So we had some nice situations where, again, as I mentioned, lightning here would produce precipitation here, and so we're staring in this direction to try to see it. We had a really nice storm on this day in fairly similar location. Here's the photometer instrument. Um, and it's kind of just seeing background sky variations. There's nothing obvious in this data. Um, it kind of looks like something here, but I have zoomed in on those, and they don't correlate with any lightning. Um, so this is a project I'm not currently working on now, but I sort of thought I would tie it in at the end as, as uh, my foray into this, into this research area in the beginning. Um, so that's all I have today. Um, here are the sort of conclusions and takeaways. If you remember anything, I hopefully you will remember some of these bullet points from my talk. Um, I'm th the, the points that I'll emphasize here in the last two, um, I think I've kind of made the point that with all of these processes, with the, the radar measurements or the optical measurements or the x-ray measurements, it's very difficult to discern the details of the precipitating signatures. Um, but a combination of these might do better than a single one. And so that's why we've got the radar in conjunction with Van Allen probes, and uh, hopefully in conjunction with other instruments in the future, an optical instrument. And then the second point I'll make is that with this this model by, uh, that I've described a little bit can do can basically simulate any precipitating distribution. And um, if you if anybody has interest in modeling particular events that you've observed in some data, um, then talk to me, and we can we can do it. <laughs>
Um, so that's all. Thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, I'm just curious, how can uh, lightning uh, induce whistle waves in the plasma sphere? Because lightning is at pretty low and lower atmosphere. Well, whistle waves propagates in, in the plasma. Yeah, so the, the, in, the initial wave that's emitted by lightning is just a you know, typical electromagnetic wave in free space. But once it traverses the ionosphere, and only a certain amount leaks through, it actually becomes a Whistler mode wave. So you get a reflection from the ionosphere, which kind of reflects the left-hand component, and then the Whistler mode actually propagates. And it, can then, it then propagates obliquely, kind of semi-following the field lines. But that propagation is very standard. It's the same, it's the same propagation as chorus or hiss or whatever you want. So, so it's actually not direct induced by the plasma produced by the lightning. It's actually a secondary right, right. process. Right, right. It becomes a Whistler once it reaches I see. space, basically. I see. So what does the um, optical, would it see a track of a particle moving? Um, of a single particle? If you had an imager, as opposed to your as photometer. To photometer. Um, what, but by a track, on you mean? Ground, on the ground, you're observing up. Yep. Would you see a streak caused by the energetic particle moving? Or do you just see a glow for the whole sky? You, you would, if you could see, if you had a beam of electrons, you could see a streak, yes. You, you would never see the emissions from a single energetic electron. It's just not intense enough. But, but, but notionally, yes. If, you, if, you, if a particle or a bunch of particles with enough energy were in a sort of a pencil beam, uh, a camera could conceivably see that, very similar to an auroral feature, yes. OK. And they might also see it once it actually gets to the ground actually and, and interferes with our sensor. See, see which? See a particle the impact the pixels on the focal plane. Oh, no. Well, these particles aren't going to reach. They, they'll never reach the ground. They get absorbed at you know 40 or 50 kilometer Hundred percent minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you need... You need uh, what, 10 to the 12 EV or something to get to the ground, I think. OK. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think you showed a factor of two difference in the brightness, depending on which power law, or whether you had power law or exponential. Oh, yeah. And that, with the combination of looking at the difference in the x-rays. These ones? Combined, uh. So before, no, in, the, in looking at the, what you had the idea of a, in, yeah, PMT. So there's a, mm -hmm. the two lines there. They're like after two, so. These ones? Yeah, in the brightness. Right? In the, uh, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the SNR. Both that and looking at the x-rays combined, could you actually get some information about what's a better fit to the distribution? Is that the hope? I think so, yes. Yeah, that is definitely the hope. The, um, I've thought about this more in terms of the x-rays than I have the optical. Um, so I will, I'll point out, you know, the, really the, the hope in a lot of this simulation, the X-ray simulation in particular, was to say, okay, we measure this X-ray spectrum, can we invert that to an electron spectrum? And people that have been doing this longer than I have uh, knew that that's really, really hard to do. Because here's, you know, five different distributions that are very different, but the spectra you get in the X-rays look almost the same. And you look then at the data, um, from barrel, and you can plot these spectra. You can take the background spectra and you can take the event spectra and plot them on top of each other, and they look the spectra look almost the same. They just go up and down. Um, so it turns out that the atmosphere is a really uh, a really good and irritating filter <laughs> that gives the exact same output for any input. <laughs> Um, you know, but that said, the, the caveat to that is that <coughs> when you look at these a little more closely, they're, they're really right on top of each other in the low energies, but at the higher energies, there is some difference. And that's where we might be able to actually tease out some information. Any other questions? Why don't we thank Bob again?